Anybody asleep out there? Anybody online asleep? If you're, if, you're, if you're sleeping, you're dead right now. All I'm saying is, bring it back. Okay, I need something over here. I need me a table. We got this new system. We got to get down. And while we're doing this, I want to say welcome to all those that are online, especially. Thank you so much for wherever you are in the world again. And we're just so thankful you're with us in worship. Thank you very much, Tanner. Appreciate that. And uh, if you're in the house here, uh, you're new. You, you need to come at a great time. Uh, if you haven't discovered already, we enjoy having a good time. Uh, we believe worshiping is fun, um, but also is an opportunity to learn. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to find them, open them up to 1 Corinthians 13. If you have message notes, you want to do some writing down, you can do that. You can also find it on the app, as Jeff so aptly described a while ago. And we're launching this new series, but we got to begin in prayer. So whether you're online or in the house, would you please just kind of pause here for a moment with us? Uh, all right, God, here we are, uh, your children, these kids of love, uh, your daughters and your sons, that for some reason, undeservedly so, you love us. And you loved us so much, you sent your son Jesus into the world. He lived a great life. He's lived a sinless life, God. We know it. The word tells us, and he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And everybody thought it was the end, God, but you raised him from the dead, telling us that, that nothing's impossible with you, God. And God, we, some of us find ourselves in some relationships that seem impossible. We got some stuff that we just can't seem to overcome. We have family dysfunction that's been passed down from generation to generation. We're in a workplace, God, where the culture is just so toxic and so negative. And we find ourselves living in a world, even in a nation, that's so divided, God, by so many different things. It seems impossible. Yet we know through your son Jesus, nothing is impossible. So we open up your word this morning, God, particularly asking you to speak into the impossible relationships of our lives. Deepen and broaden our understanding of what it means to receive and give love. Help us to be a part of the solution. That means solving the problem within each of us. And we ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we are beginning a series, we're launching a series this morning that I think what matters most in the entire world. And every once in a while, you and I are reminded that this is true, that this really is true. Like when a couple stands before God to express their 100% devotion exclusively one to the other. Sometimes we see it. Sometimes we see it when a baby is born, a grandchild is born, or your first kid, or your second, or third, and you hold this little child in your arms, and you look him in the eyes. Sometimes. Sometimes we're reminded when a police officer lays down their life, he or she, for one of their peers. We see it when a 10-year-old African-American boy shows up at an anti-police rally. And fearfully, he gives out free hugs to the police. Or in a 17-year-old Filipino girl who was sex trafficked, abused, put out on the market, who has her own two-year-old child and she lays down her life to protect her own kid from being trafficked herself. Sometimes we see it in an inner city school teacher who refuses to quit when so many of his or her colleagues have burned out and quit and worn out, but they continue to show up hoping that perhaps just one life, one single life in that inner city might be changed. Sometimes we see it in a marriage where a cold heart Just a stone-cold, frozen heart melts. And a marriage that was ending in destruction has the hope of reconciliation. Sometimes we see it when we experience someone who is old, very old in life, and they cannot take care of their own health, their own basic health needs. And a spouse 
some 60 plus years ago, had made a promise in sickness and in health. And they just keep showing up. Or maybe we see it around a hospital bed. When someone is dying. And family and friends are there. And in that moment, you, we are reminded that life is all about love. Love is what really matters. Love is the measure of all humanity. Love is real. Love is the purpose of all of our lives. Love is what God asks of all of us. Love is what really, really matters. Now last weekend, Chris started us off the new year with a, with a brilliant message and raising the question of what are you going to lay down so you can pick something up? That if you have these new resolutions, these new goals, these new aspirations in your life, before you pick it up, there's probably something you really need to lay down. And I hope you've been thinking about that. But I have another question for you. If you were only just going to choose one New Year's resolution, only one only, one resolution, and if you knew if you kept it, it would please God, what do you think that resolution would be? And I will tell you, there are all sorts of resolutions you can start and you can keep, and you can still miss out on the life that God has for you. The number one resolution that people have this time of the year is to get physically fit, to get more physically healthy. In the Bible, no one was more physically fit than Samson. So strong, his life was a train wreck. He missed it. The second number one, the second resolution most people make is to get financially healthy. To get yourselves in financial order. To stop living upside down financially. Jesus tells a story of a man who had done that. He's called the rich young ruler. He had so much wealth, he had to tear down his barns to make room for all of his new stuff. And at the end of his life, God called him a fool. Lots of money, but a fool. Some people say they want to have higher career goals. I want to have goals of climbing in my career, be more successful, reach this certain level. Good goal, nothing wrong with that. In the Bible, one of the most successful people was a man named Herod. He had achieved such a high thing, there was this label called Herod the Great, and they also called him an egomaniac. For some folks, you think, I just want to get smarter. I want to get that degree. I finally want to go back and get that degree, to get that education, to get that higher level of knowledge. Great goal. Nothing wrong with that. When you read the Bible, probably one of the most smartest people in the Bible is a man named Solomon. He was so wise. He was so smart. He had a thousand wives. Not so smart. <laughs> Not a five bed a cap of move, I would say. So if there was just one resolution, just one, one resolution you could keep, and you know that it would please God, what do you think that resolution would be? The Apostle Paul puts it this way over here in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and I give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not, do not have love, I gain nothing. Let me see if I could put it in language that some of us in this day and time can understand a little bit better. Though I can tweet like Taylor Swift... Though I have more Facebook friends than the Pope, though I have a BA from SMU and an MBA from, U, from a, a TCU, though I invent the cell phone, Facebook, TikTok, Fitbit, and a Tesla, though I have great hair, white teeth, and low body fat, 
Though I end COVID and solve global warming and resolve the, the, the political divide in our nation, though I drive a fuel solar powered Hummer, if I don't have love, In your notes, everything minus love equals nothing. Nothing plus love equals everything. Paul gets his understanding of love from a man named Jesus. Some people say he was the son of God. I believe he was. Some say he was the Messiah. I believe he was. Some say he died on the cross. He was resurrected from the dead. I believe that he was. And this great teacher, he has asked the question, what is the great purpose of life? What is the great commandment? What is it? And we all know it. Many of you know it. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the first and this is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself and all the law of all the prophets hang on these two things. So personally, I just have one resolution for 2022. At the end of the year, I want to be a more loving person. That's it. That's my word. That's my sentence. Some of you may want to adopt that. Go for it. The Pathway Church, let there be no misunderstanding. That is who we are. We are here to help increase the amount of love that's in the world. That is our role. Some churches and some people get a little fuzzy on this. You see, if you want to get more physically fit, you're going to go to a gym. If you want to get more financially fit, you're going to find some investor or some mentor to speak into your life. You also could come to your church. We have a class called Money Matters. If you're someone who's struggling in your finances, you can just kind of sign up for that and we'll help you with that. But ultimately, you're going to need some financial expertise speaking into your life. If you want to get smarter, you want to advance in your career, you're going to get a mentor. You're going to go back to school. You're going to get a certification. You're going to get another level of education. But if you want to increase your capacity to love, where do you go? You're already there. It's the church. That's the role of the church in the world to increase the amount of love that is in the world. And again, so many churches get a little fuzzy about this. We kind of lose our perspective of this. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter uh, to a young man, his, his mentee called Timothy. And in the first chapter, verse 5, he says this to him. The goal of this command, the goal of all this instruction is love. It comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. See, the goal of Christian instruction is not to know a lot. It's to love a lot. It's not about how much you know. It's about how much you know how to love. And again, so many churches kind of get fuzzy on this. You would think that this would be the goal of every church, but it's not so much. I'm just with this guy who's, who, who, wouldn't, who wouldn't come to church. I've invited him, invited him, invited him, trying to invite him. And he says, no, pastor. I, I mean, it, says, it seems like most churches are jerk factories. Churches are not to produce jerks, but jerks are welcome here. Hey, so if you're a jerk, you're welcome here. But the goal of the church is not to produce people who are jerks. But people who are, not, who are not knowing a lot, but people who are more loving. So let me be very clear. So everybody who calls this your church, your church home, know that you know who we are and what we're about. We are about making sure that everybody knows that through Jesus Christ, they are loved by God. And God loves them. And then we're connecting them, connect with them. So connect that they figure that out and they know that themselves and have that experience of one more and one more knowing God's love, okay? 
Here's the core. Here, here's what I want you to get. Here's the great purpose of what we're launching this new series. But I want to make sure you get some things before we get into the, the content of, of the series of, of, the, of the five love languages. Is it number two? God's great purpose of human existence is to grow a community of abnormally loving persons. That's God, what God wants to do through us. So let me ask you, who do you think is the greatest person around here? Is it the person with the highest IQ? Is that the greatest person? The smartest person? Is that the greatest? Is it the person who's the richest, whoever it is online or in this house, who makes the most money? Is that the person that's the greatest? Is it the person who knows the Bible the best, who can just know the Bible and quote it back to front, front to back? Is that person the greatest? Is it the person who gives the most, who's the most generous with their money? Is that person the greatest? It's very clear when you read the Bible, the greatest, the greatest, the greatest is the someone who just understands what it is to love people. That is the greatest. Now, before we get into this series, I'm trying to lay a foundational thing about this understanding of love. And we, got, we need to do a couple things before we get into the meat of the five love languages, okay? Here's what we're kind of laying a foundation. And we, first of all, we got to understand Jesus' understanding and practice of love. So in your notes, letter A, number, of number three, this is Jesus' understanding and practice of love. To will and work for the good of somebody else. That is, love is when, and through my will, I will intensely will and work for somebody else to be the very best person they can be. Love is not just about feelings. It includes feelings. But love is not just feeling. Love is not about my desires that I have, the love that Jesus has. Love is not me doing what you want me to do exactly all the time or you doing what I want you to do. Love is not agreeing on everything. This sort of love that Jesus had is always working for the good in the other person's life. You want the best for them and you work for the best for them. Now, the problem that you and I have, that you and I have watered down this word so love, we use it in so many different ways, right? I love you. I love my kids. I love my house. I love my job. I love Texas. I love ice cream. What does that even mean to say I love ice cream? It certainly does not mean I will the good for that ice cream. What that means is I'm going to crush that ice cream. I'm going to devour that ice cream. I'm going to consume all that ice cream for me to take care of my needs, to take care of my wants, to take care of my desires, to take care of my issues. But Jesus says, real love is this unselfish love that's working for the good, for the best of the other person. Because that's what Jesus does. It's an incredible concept, and, and so incredible is this concept, the people who follow Jesus, they go, man, we've got to find a word to describe this. And so they found this word, and some of you know about this word, some of you have heard about this word, some of you know nothing about it, but I want to explain just a minute about it, because until you really understand this word, you don't know anything about this church, and you don't understand anything about Jesus. And that word is agape. Now, that word agape you know, is, is, is the Greek word for love. And in the Bible, it was rarely used back in this culture in this time. It was a word kind of set aside. In fact, when the Old Testament gets translated into Greek, they only used the agape word one time. One time. It was kind of a rare thing. This word was not well defined. It had no real meaning. So they pulled apart this word so they could pour meaning into it. And into this word, we get to practice and understand of who Jesus is in this word called agape. And this word is used many, many times in the New Testament. So in your notes, literally the word agape, letter B, under three, is condition of being. It's a condition of being. It's not something that I do. It's something about who I am. It's like being healthy. It's something on the inside of me. That God's love is increasing within me and sin is decreasing. Let me repeat that. 
Agape love is where God's love that fights for me, that works for me, is filling up in me, and my sin is decreasing, so I'm always wanting the good for the other person. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with my feelings or my thoughts for them. Agape love is not like a faucet I turn off and on. I don't love this person. This person is hard to love. I turn the faucet off. This person is easy to love. I turn the faucet on. Agape love is a condition of who I am with every single person I meet and I know, regardless what they think about me or I think about them, whether I like them or I don't like them. That is agape love. That is Jesus' kind of love that he has for you and me. And how I love other people with this love depends on who that person is. I don't love everybody the same way. That's important. If I come across somebody who is hungry and I love them with agape love, I give them food. If I come across somebody that is lonely and I love them with agape love, I listen to them and just with them. If I I love somebody with agape love who's afraid, who's full of fear, I encourage them and build them up and speak truth and hope and encouragement into their life. But if I'm loving someone, if I'm loving a child, let's say I'm loving a child, and let's say this child is my child, and let's say this child is a spoiled, bratty child. If I love this child with agape love, how am I going to love this spoiled, bratty child? I'm going to give them discipline. I'm going to give them boundaries. I'm going to allow them to have consequences where they see the pain of their behavior so it changes. Because I want the best for them. I want to will the good in their life. Now, here's the problem here with this. This is why so many of us don't do this. See, if I give somebody food and they're hungry, they're going to feel close to me. They're going to feel like, oh, man, Pastor Rick was so nice. He gave me food. I feel feel a relationship. If somebody's lonely, lonely, right, and I come and I listen to them, and we have a good conversation, I I listen, pay attention, they all, I feel close because, man, they at least listen to me. But it's my child or to anybody else. They need discipline. They need a hard word. If I give a hard word to my kid who's a spoiled brat, I give them, are they going to feel close to me? No. Not at all. Here's the truth. In your notes number four, to be a loving person, I must sometimes be, I must be prepared to sometimes be seen as unloving. That means that I am so secure so secure in the agape love that God has for me that I can speak the truth in love, not in anger, not in hurt, not because of my own dysfunction, not because of my own drama and issues in me. I can speak the truth in love to because I really want the best for them, not so they can do something for me. The scripture has something to say about this. It's a very challenging, very challenging thing to do. Over here in the book of Ephesians. Are y'all with me out there? If you're online, type in and say, I'm with you. Say, say, I'm with you. Here we go. Here's what it says. Verse, chapter 3, Ephesians, verse 17. And I pray that you be rooted and established in love. When a tree is rooted, it's being fed. When a tree is rooted, it's being nourished. When a tree is rooted, it is alive. When it is unrooted, it dies. But when you are rooted in God's love for you, God's agape, unconditional, that fights for you, the song we just sang, that bold-faced lies gets rid of. When he does that, you rooted in that love, it says, you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, and how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. Now, here's the problem. You and I think romantic love is where the power is. You get all goosebumply, I'm falling in love. They're falling in love with you. They just kind of made me spine tingly all over. I get, ah, get all gushy-wushy. And you think that love has power. 
That love fails all the time. If that's all you're grounded in your relationship, you're in trouble. But agape love, that always wants the good, the will for another person. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, it says, that love never fails, ever. Romantic love will fail, but that agape love, it never fails, the Bible says. It has power, real power. Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul said, there is nothing not life, not death, nor height, not power, not demon. Nothing can separate you from the love, the agape love of God. Nothing. The Apostle Paul says in Romans, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Evil will overcome you if you're not rooted in God's love, because only God's love can overcome evil evil. So you want to have power? You're rooted, rooted in the kind of love that God has for you. Now until you get to that, we can't even get to this love language book. That's the whole setup. So in the time we have left, I'm going to try to kind of get us about 12, 15 minutes. I'm going to kind of help us kind of get into this series a little bit more with that kind of setup about the five love languages with the understanding of love like this, okay? Here's the first core idea of this book, that identifying and using the love languages of the main people in my life can transform the relationship, and it can we all receive this agape kind of love, and we have a need for it in different ways. And when you learn that of the people around you, and you give it and receive it, it transforms relationships. Now, we'll go through these throughout this series. Some people do it through the right words. Some people through quality time. If they just hang with you, spend time with you, you feel close. You feel this bond between you. So, so some people, it's uh, gifts. They're creative in giving gifts, and they love to receive those sort of gifts. Some people, it's acts of service. When someone is serving, taking care of a need, unspoken, they just feel the need. For some folks, it's physical touch. It is important that you know that, so we're going to help you. We have this on your life steps. You'll see this web address you can go to. You can take the little test to find what your love language is, but also the people around you. You can also walk out this building, and online will give you access to this stuff online. If you're watching online, okay, but if you're on site, you walk out the doors right to your right on this resource wall. You can pull off the stuff about parenting love language, marriage, dating, anything in your family to help you learn and how to take this test to find your love language, okay? But that's part of the homework. Before next week, you know what your love language is and the importance of the people around you. Because when you know their love language and you speak it, it changes everything. Not just know it, but use it. Now, let me give you just a little example of how important this is. You think that you would love all your kids the same way. You don't love your kids all the same way. Your kids are wired, all kinds are wired differently. Oh, we have three sons, and I would tuck our sons in at night, and I would go in and say prayers with them, and I would love to have this bonding connection because dad loves to do that, and I would want to speak words of life into them. So the one little son, I would come in and say, I would say, I would say his name, and I'd say, man, I just love your voice. I just love your look. I just love how you talk. I just love you. I'm so happy to be your dad. I just love you so much. He would look up at me and say, dad, I love you too. With all this I go in the room with the next son. Hey, son, man, I just love you so much. I love your laugh, your little voice. He just looks up at me and just stares. Nothing. <laughs> Dad, you got something hanging out of your nose. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And the danger is this. That I think that this kid doesn't feel the bond between us. But the problem is, I'm just not speaking his love language. But I go get all upset and make a big, oh, no, there's something wrong. He doesn't love me. He doesn't care for me. And that's what so many of you do. Because you're speaking a love on the other person. They're not getting it. So the next night, I go tuck the one kid in. And I give all the, all the goosey-goosey. Yeah, Dad, I love you. I go in with him. 
I jump in the bed with him, and I'm wrestling, and I'm tickling him and laughing him all up and down. He says, Dad, I love you so much. I do, too. We hugged and everything like that. His little love tank got filled up by physical touch. Now, mom's love tank wasn't filled up because I got them all riled up at bedtime, and they didn't want to go to bed after that. They were just hyped up all just like this. But the point is, you got to know the love language of the people in your life and use it for you to feel that bonding connection, and you can and you will. I want to talk about words here for just a little bit that we have the time that we have left. Turn over to Ephesians 4.29. This is the key verse for this particular passage, a key verse. Ephesians 4.29. Put it on the screen. Here's how it goes. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Stop right there. And I got a question for you. Do you think Paul meant that? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Or do you think maybe he was inebriated when he wrote it? Do you think maybe he was smoking something? Do you think he didn't think it through? I think he meant it. How much would you have to stop talking if you didn't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth? How many conversations would you not be able to have if you made a promise to not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth? If you had to go back, how many days would be silent because you just couldn't talk? Because if you opened it, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit them who listen. But most of us talk to meet our needs. Most of us talk because I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm hurt, I want you to do this, me, 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 me. It has nothing to do with the other person. But agape love speaks into other people's life according to their needs that builds them up. Are you getting it? The right words. You speak because that's some people's love language. Now we're going to give you a verse right here. I want some of you to memorize Proverbs 25, 11. And put this on the screen, please. It's from the ESV version. This is from ESV. A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. Would you say that with me, please? A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. In other words, there in your notes, the right word in the right tone to the right person is gold. That's what that's saying. And we all know that's true because you've experienced it. The right word, the right tone, the right time, right person, you've seen it be transforming. So here's part of your homework. I want you to begin thinking right now, people in your life, that love language, you know that love, their love language is, is the right words. I want you to be thinking, I want you to be thinking about them, about what you want to say, what you need to say, what they need to hear. You can do this. I want to promise you can do it. Sincere, genuine, simple. But here's the important thing to hear, not manipulative. In your notes, number three. Loving right words are sincere, not manipulative. The Apostle Paul said, love must be sincere. And unfortunately, too many of us, we speak to manipulate others to get what we want. We are all con artists in many ways. We use our words to get people to do what we want for our purpose, for our needs, not to build them up. And that's manipulation. And we all experience it. You go to a restaurant. Happened to me here not too long. Go to a restaurant. You order something, right? And you go, oh, man, you order this. They go, Fan, fantastic. You order this over here. Somebody else wants great choice. Oh, that was an amazing idea. Good. You order, say dessert. No, I'm not having dessert. Very, very wise. You ever had that experience? You go into a restaurant. I don't care what you say. They have that positive word to say to you. So one time I'm having this experience. 
And when they bring the check, I just kind of got, hey, well, I'm going to ask a question. I said, listen, have you ever had somebody come in to order something and you say, you moron, that was the stupidest selection that ever, that, was, that stuff tastes terrible. Why did you do that? He said, no, never done that. I said, how come? He said, because back there in the kitchen, we had these nine affirmations. And every time somebody orders something, we are told to give them one positive affirmation. To build them up, to make them feel good about their selection. Whatever it may be. And I'm going, what's the motive behind that? You think it's to build you up? It's to build up the tip. It's to get, it's manipulation that you feel, oh, weren't they great? Weren't they great? And so you get, I would say, who of us feel so low self-esteem that you go to a restaurant? You know what? I'm feeling kind of low tonight. I think I'll go to a restaurant so my table server can build me up and speak kind words to me and make me feel good about myself. And so when I order the macaroni and cheese, they'll say, you must have gone to Rice University. And I'll go, yes, I'm so smart. <laughs> Who does that? That's manipulation. But sincere, genuine words are only about the other person. Agape love. So here's your assignment in your notes. Assignment is to think of the qualities and the behaviors, number four, of the key people in my life. Qualities and behaviors I admire, I appreciate, and then I'm going to tell them. If you need help, you have, write, find your little journal, think of the person, and write down a couple of words. It could be so simple. Hey, that color looks great on you. Hey, your hair, that, 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 new, that new hair, I, I like that hair. It looks good on you. Great decision, great idea, really good. Hey, I, I saw you, how you handled the kids out on the crossing. That was, that was pretty cool, pretty calm, pretty cool parenting. Very simple. I've been thinking about some of the people in my life that if they were on the front row right here, I'm going to imagine they were or watching online. What would I say to them? Just people that over the holidays that I failed to speak into the life. Here's what I would say to my three sisters. You know what, sisters? I don't tell you enough how much I admire how you take care of mom and dad when I'm so busy. And y'all, y'all just pour so much in taking care of mom and dad. And I just respect the kind of daughters you are at this time of their life. I just, you're, you're, you're amazing. I don't tell you that enough. To my mother. And I know she's watching right now from home. Mom, I so respect you. You have showed me for 68 years that you loved dad in sickness and in health, for better or for worse. And now I know how hard it is. And I don't know all the things that you have to put up with. And yet you do it every day. Your grit and your tenacity is just you taught me so much, Mom. I want you to know that. I know. To my dad. You know what, Dad? I know you're going through this dementia battle. And you sometimes you don't know what's true and what's not. And you, you get so frustrated. But you're still my hero, Dad. You taught me everything I needed to know. I'm so proud to be known as your son. To my three sons. If my three sons were here, I would say, Justin, uh, you're my oldest, and one day you'll be the head of the family, probably. I will die, and I want you to know, son, you are more than capable of leading our family. I trust you. You got this, son. To Jacob, my middle child, my second one, I would say, Jacob, you know, you're my kind of my mini-me. <laughs> you're kind of my shadow. You always were my shadow, but now I live in your shadow because what you do as a teacher you do more ministry in your job every single day with students than I ever will over the course of my life. And I'm so proud of the difference that you're making in people's lives. You're a life changer. To James, my youngest, I would say, you're the youngest, you're the baby, but you got more grit. You're the toughest. You've had to endure so much. And the fact that in a four-month period, your brother-in-law died, and then your friend in your wedding died, your roommate died, and how you handled that with such courage and poise and such love, how you loved them and spoke, I just, I, I so admire that, son. I, I couldn't do that at your age. 
You're so far ahead of me. To all three of my daughter-in-laws, if you're watching right now, because you're all scattered about, I would say, uh, I love you like you're my flesh and blood. Dowson, I prayed for you before you were ever born, that God would allow the right person at the right time. And I will tell you, you are. And we're so proud that you have the name Owen connected to you. To my wife of 43 years. You know, babe, every weekend I stand up here and I do this thing called teaching. And people pat me on the back and I get these little cards and emails and everything. But here's what I know. It never would have happened. If you hadn't drugged the kids to church all by yourself all those years, when I was not around, you were a single mom so much. And this church is where it is today because of your generosity and your grace and your kindness and you're overlooking so many faults in me because you know the truth. Church, here's all I'm trying to say. You're missing out on life. If you don't take the time to speak into people's life the right word at the right time to the right person because sometimes that's the only way they experience love from you. That's their language and you've got to know it and you've got to speak it. Now somebody needs to write this down. It's not your notes. Humble words communicate love. I'm sorry. That's on me. I messed up. I was trying to be funny. It wasn't funny. Humble words communicate love. Not boasting. In fact, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, in that first little verse right there, he starts talking for four. He says, love doesn't boast. But I boast, and you boast. Why do we boast? Love doesn't boast. Love doesn't need to boast. You and I boast. We tell stories. We run up. We get defensive because we want validation from the other person. We want them to tell us we're okay. We want them their approval. But when you're grounded in the approval of God's love and what God says about you and who he says you are, You don't need to boast. You don't need to be defensive. You don't need to justify. You don't need to rationalize because you're rooted in that love. Please get this. This is important. This is not about trying to be a more, do the more loving things. If all you do is try to do more loving things, you're going to miss it. You'll get frustrated and you'll quit. This is about becoming naturally a more loving person that you naturally want the best for another person. You just naturally want what's best for them. You just naturally want that. And it just flows out of you naturally. Because if you force it, you'll quit and you'll fail because that kind of love always fails. And that's why you have family dysfunction and conflict all the time. It only comes when you're rooted in the love that God has for you. And his love increases and your selfish sin decreases. So the most important words are not going to be the words that you speak. They're going to be these last words that you hear. In the Gospel of Mark, I went through it trying to find all the different ways that Jesus expressed love. And I found something very interesting. The first words of love were not words that Jesus spoke, but words that were spoken to him. And in Mark chapter 1, before he, right after he is baptized, he hears these words from God. Verse 11, you're my son, I love you, I'm pleased with you. You're my son, I love you, I'm pleased with him. He goes straight into the wilderness to do battle with the devil for 40 days. And he's only able to do that because he heard those right words at the right time and the right tone into his life. You're my son, I love you, I'm pleased with you, I'm proud of you. He goes into the wilderness for 40 days and he fights. He comes out to go begin his ministry. But before he begins all this ministry, the thing to do. The scripture says, verse 35, early in the morning, while it's still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, he went to a solitary place where he prayed. What was he doing? He was listening to the voice that said, I love you. I'm 
proud of you. I'm pleased with you. He went out. I want you to stand. If you're online, stick with me. You're about to walk out and you think the service is over. The service is just beginning. You didn't just come to learn. You just didn't come. You come to practice love. Because I promise you, somebody came here today. They needed to be loved. And you can't do it until you get this. Hear this. God's saying to you right now, I know everything about you and I love you. You're my son. You're my daughter. I know it all. I love you. I'm proud of you. Be rooted in that. Then speak it to each other. Don't walk out this door. Don't get offline without you speaking, connecting to someone. Say, hello, how are you? How are you? I'm glad you came. Hey, my name is Rick. Don't say that unless your name is Rick, okay? But just say, hey, my name is, and just connect with them, okay? Just do that. God, we just thank you for the great love you have for us. It's so overwhelming. God, we cannot believe it that you know everything about us and you still want the best for us. Just help us, God, to be like Jesus. Help us to look for the good in people and to be the best that people need. Help us, God, to speak words of truth even when it's painful for the other person. God, ground us in who you are, not who they say we are. Remove the selfish sin from our life, God, to have the other person meet our needs that only you can meet. And just help us how to love. And God, there's so many in here that are wounded. There's so many here that are hurt. They don't even know how to love because they're so angry. They got so many wounds and gaping holes and baggage and dysfunction. God, I pray for healing. Just pray for healing. And even in this, help them to love like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. See you next week. We'll learn some more.